الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا وشفيعنا وحبيبنا وسندنا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله تبارك وتعالى عليه وعلى اله واصحابه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحان الذي اسرى بعبده ليلا من المسجد الحرام الى المسجد الاقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من اياتنا انه هو السميع البصير واتينا موسى الكتاب وجعلناه هدى لبني اسرائيل الا تتخذوا من دوني وكيلا ذريه من حملنا مع نوح انه كان عبدا شكورا وقال تعالى واذ قلنا لك ان ربك احاط بالناس وما جعلنا الرؤيا التي اريناك الا فتنه للناس والشجره الملعونه في القران ونخوفهم فما يزيدهم الا طغيانا كبيرا وقال تعالى بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والنجم اذا هوى ما ضل صاحبكم وما غوى وما ينطق عن الهوى ان هو الا وحي يوحى علمه شديد القوى ذو مرة فاستوى وهو بالافق الاعلى ثم دنا فتدلى فكان قاب قوسين او ادنى فاوحى الى عبده ما اوحى ما كذب الفؤاد ما راى لقد راى من ولقد راه نزله اخرى عند سدره المنتهى عندها جنه الماوى اذ يغشى السدره ما يغشى ما زاغ البصر وما طغى لقد راى من ايات ربه الكبرى صدق الله مولانا العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ما قال ربنا وخالقنا ورازقنا من الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين ان الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما بروجري بريسا اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيدنا ابراهيم وعلى ال سيدنا ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد كما باركت على سيدنا ابراهيم وعلى ال سيدنا ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد respected elders brothers friends those listening at home first of all we thank allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all his blessings especially the blessing of giving us tawfiq to perform salatul asr with jamaat may allah give us tawfiq to perform all salat with jamaat and may allah accept our humble ibadat may allah be pleased with us today's jalsa is regarding miraj un nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam maulana zakaria sahab came to our our institute his institute few weeks ago with a few boys for admission and he said molana sahab aap aate nahi hamari yahan kabhi aao na hamari yahan chakkar lagao maine kaha no problem aayenge inshallah aap bulao hazir e khidmat and molana sahab <coughs> suggested this day i was also going to london so i said this is okay for me it's on the way alhamdulillah we agreed and the topic was miraj un nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam and this is how we have arrived over here may allah give me the tawfiq to say something which is beneficial for all of us Amen. first of all what is isra and miraj 
In our Indian subcontinent, it's normally known as Mi'raj, Mi'raj, Laylatul Mi'raj. And in the Arabian culture, it's more known as Isra, Laylatul Isra. Both are right, because both words are used in Quran and in Hadith. In Quran, Asra bi'abdihi. In Hadith, thumma utiya bil mi'raj. So that's where it comes from. What is mi'raj? First of all, mi'raj is a miracle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because it was a miraculous journey. There were no aeroplanes, helicopters at that time. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam traveled within a flash from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al -Aqsa. And not only that, he traveled from there to high above the heavens and he returned within a very short span of time. A short time of the night. Now, human being cannot travel physically at such a distance uh, especially during those times, maybe today you can say someone go in an aeroplane from Mecca to Masjid Aqsa within 2-3 hours, but that would also take time and then returning that would also take time but nobody can go high above the heavens and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying I went physically not in a dream, not in a vision it was physical journey. He went by himself. This is why Mi'raj is a miracle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We as Muslims, alhamdulillah, believe in all the miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His greatest miracle is the Quran. It's a living miracle. You see Hafiz Sahib reading Quran so nicely. Mu'jizah of Quran. Young kids becoming Hafiz, mu'jizah of the Quran. Many, many mu'jizahs in the Quran. Its, pre its, its preservation till today is a miracle. Many people try to wipe it out from the face of the earth, but they couldn't. It's preserved in its original form. It's a miracle. During the time of Mamulu Rashid, this person came to his court and Mamulu Rashid invited him to Islam. He was a Jew. He said, I'll think about it. Mamulu Rashid explained. He went away. After a year, he came back and he declared his shahada. So Mahmoud said, why? At that time I explained to you, you didn't accept, and now you are coming yourself. And he said, well, after I went from here, I wanted to check your deen out. So I took some copies of the Torah, and I made three, four uh, uh, copies of it. I wrote them myself. I added some things in there, took some things out of it. And then I took it to the, uh, the, the rabbis and said that this is a beautiful copy of Torah, nicely handwritten, very beautiful. They accepted it. Thank you very much. They thanked me. And I noticed that there is so much garbage in here. Then I did the same with the Bible. I took it to Christian. They accepted it. But then I did the same with the Quran. I added some things in there, took some out, and I took it to the Muslims. And they said, let us check it first. They checked it. And when they saw that garbage in there, they just threw it away. They said, Toba, Toba, garbage. Take it away from here. So I realized that Quran cannot be tampered with. And it is true and it is in reality protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Through the Hufazi Kiram, it can never be changed till the day of Qiyamah. And this is what prompted me to accept the truth. Quran is the truth and is the word of Allah. It is the book of Allah and that's why I am accepting. So Quran is miracle. Similarly, Mi'raj is also a miracle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This miraculous journey. What happens? You have heard it in the nutshell. Then we will go in the detail. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is in Makkah Mukarramah. And this is before Hijrah. Before he migrated from Makkah to Medina Munawwara, maybe a year or two or three years before uh, migration. So he is in Makkah Mukarramah. Sayyiduna Jibreel alayhi salam comes with another mm, uh, uh, angel, as in some riwayat. And then they open the chest of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa They take his heart out, wash it, fill it with iman and hikmat, and then they, uh, they sew it back and then uh, replace it. And 
Then they bring the Burak and he rides on the Burak and he goes to Baytul Maqdis and he sees Baytul Maqdis. And the uh, Anbiya salam, are also present over there waiting. He leads them in Salah. He comes out and he is offered two uh, vessels, one of wine, another of milk. And he prefers the milk and he drinks it. He was thirsty. He needed some drink. He drank the milk. And then they traveled on high above the heavens. A mi'raj was brought. Mi'raj means step ladder in which you can climb. Now he did not have to climb on there. He just stood on it. And that mi'raj, today we can understand it in the form of escalator or lift. So he stood on that lift and he was taken zoom within seconds high above the heavens. And on the first heaven, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and then up to Sidratul Muntaha, and after Sidratul Muntaha to the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he was given some gifts over there, and then he came back to Baytul Maqdis, and Burak was still over here. He rode back on the Burak, and he came back on the Burak to Makkah Mukarramah, and uh, it was still night over here. It was nearly Subhi Sadiq's time. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa came back to his home and informed his family members that I've just been to Jerusalem and back. And Ummi Hanik said that, I know we, we believe in you, we trust you, but if you say this outside, people will mock you, so don't tell anyone. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, no, I'm going to tell everyone. Why should I hide something which Allah has given me? So he came out outside and he told people and they asked him a few questions and he gave the right answers and they knew that he had never been to Jerusalem during his 53 years of his lifetime because he was about 52, 53 at the time of Mi'raj so during his life of 50 years he'd never been to Jerusalem they knew because they knew him inside out they knew where he had been he'd only been to Busra maybe or uh, to Buhira Rahim's place apart from that he never traveled beyond that place and wherever they used to go, they used to go in caravans. Nobody could travel alone. So the caravans which went, the amount of times he traveled outside the city of Makkah, they knew everything and they knew that he's never been to Jerusalem. But when they asked him about the Masjid of Jerusalem, how is the dome, for example, how are the pillars, how is the mihrab, what is the color of this, and what is that, and where is this, and how are the trees, and he gave the proper description, and they said he's telling the truth. And it seemed that yes, he's been there. <coughs> so, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this miraculous journey, and many people, uh, alhamdulillah, you know, believed in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because of this. Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu confirmed that what he is saying is truth. And because of this confirmation, he was given the laqab of Siddiq. Because he, without any stuttering, he believed in every word the Prophet ﷺ said. Mm -hmm. And Allah revealed in the Quran, Sayyiduna Ali ibn Abi Talib says that on that time, Abu Bakr was given the title of Siddiq, and from then on he was known as, as Siddiq. So, this is the journey of Mi'raj in a nutshell, a summary of it. Now we go into a little bit of detail. First of all, what is the timing of this journey? When did it happen? As I mentioned, it was before migration. Now, how, how many months or years before migration? Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi in Sharh Muslim has mentioned many versions. This is because at that time there was no uh, ihtiman and fikr of keeping the dates and everything, recording, so uh, the, it was unimportant. Main important thing was the events. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam just informed them of the events. So the day, some muhabbisin say this time, that time, some say it was in the five, a year five after Nububwa. Others say, وَقَدْ فَشَلْ إِسْلَامُ Makkah. It happened when Islam had spread out throughout Makkah Mukarramah and people were aware of Islam. And most of the Muardikhin say it was roughly around the year 10 after Nuhuva, nearly two to three years before Hijrah. And before that, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the believers 
were forced to go out of the city of Mecca. There was a boycott. They were driven out. And they had to stay in Shabia bin Talib for three years. And these three years were very hard because of lack of food, boycott, no social activity. They were not allowed in the city. So they had to go through a lot. And the, 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 the Mu'mineen and the believers and also the family of Hashim, Banu Hashim, even some of them were not believing in Rasulullah but they supported Rasulullah because he was there. Abu Talib also supported Rasulullah and he stayed in that valley for three years even though he did not say you are a Rasul but he said still I'm going to support you, you are my nephew and uh, I will uh, look after you. So they stayed in that valley for nearly three years after the boycott finished and the Mushrikeen uh, you know, had some disagreement among themselves and they said that this is no good, we shouldn't keep those people uh, in such a wretched state and many youth among them got up and they, they challenged the elders and they said that we should bring them back. So Banu Hashim and the believers were allowed back into the city and uh, as soon as they came back, a few days later, Abu Talib fell ill and he died. And then three days later, Khadija radiallahu anha also fell ill and she also passed away. Now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was going through a real tough time. Because these two were his Sahara, his support. Abu Talib outside and Khadija inside the house. She used to console him and she used to, you know, get all, uh, uh, all, uh, absorb all the tension from him. She, looked, uh, she used to look after the children and uh, she would look after the household and she would help Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And both supports uh, deserted him. So Rasulullah was very down. And it is at that time Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam traveled to Taif. So he went to Taif and the people of Taif also deserted him, rejected him and uh, they persecuted him. He returned, he was really downhearted. While he was coming back in Makkah Mukarramah, Mut'im ibn Adi used to uh, live in the outskirt of Makkah Mukarramah. He saw his state, his pitiful state and he had some pity on him. And he said, Muhammad, I give you my protection. Don't worry, nobody will harm you. So he came to the Kaabatullah Sharif and he said, nobody should harm Muhammad, he is under my protection. Rasulullah sallallahu thanked him. He felt a bit relieved because the persecution would be uh, lessened now. Nobody would attempt to murder him now. So he was under a little bit of protection. It is at this time when he was really down that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with Mi'raj. Allah showed him this miracle. Allah wanted to give him some tasalli, confidence, and you know, boost his morale. What happened is, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at one evening, had some da'wat at the house of Umm Hani, where they used to gather. Umm Hani was the sister of Sayyiduna Ali, the daughter of Abu Talib. So the family had gathered over there, and uh, 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 Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was requested to stay overnight and he uh, w w went to sleep there. So he says, while I was resting, one hadith in Muslim says, now in Muslim, Sahih Muslim, there are nearly 27 hadith of Mi'raj, narrated from approximately 10 to a dozen different Sahaba Ridwanullah al Anas ibn Malik, Malik ibn Sa'asa, Jabir ibn Abdullah, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, and they all give you know a little bit of details because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did not mention this hadith of Mi'raj in one place or one sitting. He used to narrate it in different sittings like you hear bayans from different ulamas. So many times in one mawqa, another mawqa, another sitting. So whoever sahabi was there, whatever he grasped, he narrated. That is why various different riwayat come with regards to the Mi'raj and with regards to other things as well. Uh, sometimes you get different versions, different wordings, because Rasulullah said in the different sittings, that's why the different wordings come. So, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says that while I was lying down, the roof of my house opened up. The roof opened up. And it's amazing. You know, if you see the roof of house opening up, you see, what is this? And then two malaika come down. And then they carry Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa 
And while he's in that state, they take him to uh, Hatim, the area around Kaabatullah Sharif, which is excluded from Kaaba, out of Kaaba. So it was empty, it was night time, they put him there and he is resting. Someone else maybe was sleeping there as well. So they put him down there and Rasulullah also keeps lying down and he is between that state of sleeping and awake. So they leave him there for a bit and then Jibreel salam comes with a golden tray, pure golden tray and in that tray there is some bowl filled with uh, uh, some water and another bowl filled with Iman and Hikmat as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa puts it. So he says that Jibreel alayhi salam opened my chest up from my throat to my abdomen and to my navel and uh, he opened the chest up and he took my heart out and he washed it with zamzam and then he filled it with that Iman and Hikmat faith, belief, and wisdom. Now this faith and belief, wisdom filled, it with, filled, filled with it. Someone might ask that how can this be possible? You know, a person is alive and he is being operated upon and his heart is taken out. Hazrat Shaykh Zakaria Nawarallahu Murkadahu writes in Taqreer Bukhari Sharif that agar aaj ke zamane ka ek isai doctor heart transplant kar sakta hai to Allah ka ek muqaddas farishta Allah ke mahboob peghambar ka heart transplant kyun nahi kar sakta that this believer this you know doctor of this day and age they do that operation in such a state that you know in America a person is awake he only this part his uh, 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 you know kya kehte hain usko kya kehte hain usko injection laga dete hain बेहोश हो जाता है लेकिन ऊपर का अनस्थेटिक नहीं देते पूरा लोकल अनस्थेटिक नॉट जनरल अनस्थेटिक सो द पर्सन इज यू नो अवेक एंड ही सीज ऑन द स्क्रीन हाउ हिज हार्ट इज बीइंग टेकन आउट एंड इज बीइंग टू एवरीथिंग इज डन ही कैन सी इट सो इफ इट्स डन टुडे देन द मुकद्दस फरिश्ता जिब्रील अमीन अलैहि सलाम कुड हैव डन इट दैट टाइम एज़ वेल बाय द पावर गिवन बाय अल्लाह सुभान व तआला सो हिज हार्ट इज टेकन आउट एंड इट इज फिल्ड विद ईमान एंड हिकमत Someone will say, you can't see Iman and Hikmat, it's not something that you can fill it in. So we will say, of course, energy, strength in our body, we can fill it. You know, like to today, some people give injections for energy and boost their body, power up. So if they, they, there's something that can be filled in your body, so this Iman and Hikmat can be filled in the heart. So Iman and Hikmat is filled in the heart. This type of opening and cleaning the chest happened twice before as well. Once when Rasulullah was five years old and he was playing uh, uh, with his friends in, in, in the area of Halima Sa'diyah anha. So at that time, he, for the angel Jibreel came and opened his heart and cleaned it. And secondly, before Wahi, at the time of Wahi in Ghari Hira, that time as well, one hadith says at that time the heart was opened up as well. And now this is the third time. Hafiz ibn Hajar rahmatullahi alayhi writes that for every uh, opening and cleaning of the heart there is a reason behind it. And he explains that, we don't want to go into the detail. Shah Abdul Aziz Muhaddis Dehlavi rahmatullahi alayhi has explained it in more detail in the ayat Alam nashrah laka sadrak wa wada'ana anka wizrak alladhi anqada zahrak This sharh is sadr. He said physically as well and ruhani and spiritually as well. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa heart, Hafiz ibn Hajar says that this third time is because wuzu kamil hota hai teen dafi dhona se. Complete wuzu is when you wash three times. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa heart was washed three times to completely wash and for complete cleanliness. And because he was going to the presence of Allah, so it needed to be filled with that iman and hikmat and that strength. So he can go and he can observe all that. Otherwise, any other soft person like, like me and you, you know, we would have just fainted over there. But Rasulullah's heart was strong, made strong and strengthened in this manner. So he can observe everything when he goes over there, which Allah said, لِنُرِيَهُ مِنْ آيَاتِنَا إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa heart is put back and then uh, Burak, he's, he's, he, he, everything is now ready and then he says Muhammad get up and then he brings Burak. Burak is an animal, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said smaller than a mule, larger than a donkey. But 
It's an amazing animal. And it travels at the speed of Barq. Barq means lightning. Bijli. Bijli ki speed per travel karta hai. Of Bijli, you know, lightning within a flash from high above the clouds and down to the earth. And in blink of an eye, it comes from there to here. So Burak also used to travel in the blink of an eye. One minute over here and the second minute is far away. Zoom as far as the eyes can see. And within a flash, Burak and Rasulullah sat on it and he had no complication, no risk of falling over or anything because this was a special ride sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Burak because of ikram, because of izzat. When you call a special guest over to your house, you send a car for them. I'll send someone to pick you up. And then someone goes with a beautiful Mercedes and then brings them to your house. And this is Ikram. So similarly, Allah sent Burak because of his Ikram and Izzat. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sat on the Burak and then he traveled uh, 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 with Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, and within a flash he arrives at, uh, at, 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 at Baytul Maqdis. There is one hadith which says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa saw a few scenes on his way to Baytul Maqdis. While he was traveling to Baytul Maqdis, he saw some scenes. Four scenes are mentioned in the hadith of Ibn Abi Hatim Bayhaqi and Bazar and Tabrani who classed it as Sahih. He says, Shaddad ibn Aus radiallahu anhu narrates that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, when we departed from Makkah Mukarramah, we passed by an area in which there were plenty of date trees. Khajur ke jar. Jibreel Amin alayhi salatu wa salam told me to dismount Bura and pray two rakat salah over there, which I did. And then he said, that this is going to be your place of hijrat. After hijrat, you're going to arrive over here. It was Yathrib, Medina Hunagara. Thereafter, Rasulullah says, we moved further and we came upon the Wadi of Sina. And there was the Shajarah of Musa alayhi salam. The tree of Musa alayhi salam through which Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Musa alayhi salam. So Jibreel alayhi salam said, Muhammad, get down and pray to Rakas because this is a blessed place. On this mount of Tur and on near this shajara, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Musa alayhi salam. So much rahmah uh, had, had descended upon Musa alayhi salam over here. So pray to Rakas over here. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi said, I prayed to Rakas over there. Thereafter, we move forward. And he says that we came upon a city, and Jibreel Amin said, This is the city of Madian, where Shuraib used to stay, and where Musa resided for 10 years. So pray two rakats over here. We prayed two rakats salah over there. Thereafter, we move forward, and we came upon a place, and he said, Oh Muhammad, this place is <coughs> Baytul Lahm. The birthplace of Sayyiduna Isa ala Nabihina alayhi salatu wasalam. Sayyiduna Maryam alayhi salam gave birth to Isa alayhi salam over here. And this is a barakati place because Allah's rahmah descended upon Maryam alayhi salam. And a special a miracles were witnessed over here in the form of that tree giving some fresh dates and in the form of that spring water springing from their sweet water and she was told to drink from that water. This is Rahman and Barakat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which came, happened over here. So pray two rakats over here. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, we pray two rakats over there. And then we moved on. <coughs> the hadith, this up to here is in... Ibn Abi Hatim, Bayhaqi, Bazzar and Tabrani and both Bazzar and Tabrani said this hadith is Sahih. What is this hadith? Sahih. Sahih. And what do we learn from that hadith? That places of Barakah should be respected. If we go to such a place where there is Barakah, then we should try and pray some Salah over there because this is Barakati place. 
And we, alhamdulillah, believe in barakah. You know, if people go to some area to visit some place and you go in a beautiful masjid, then at least you should pray a few rakats over there. There is a hadith which says among the signs of qiyamah is that a person will pass by a masjid and he will just look at it and he won't pray any salah in there. Today people go to visit mosque and just go around, have a look, nice beautiful masjid and then they go out without praying any salah in there. So if you go to a place where there is barakat, rahmah, Allah is descending, try and get some rahmah from there. We believe in rahmah and barakah. And this is why Mawlana Sahib was just reciting about rawdah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Some people today say that you shouldn't say rawdah of Rasul. You should say qabr of Rasul. Why, bhai? said, why rawda? Rawda means garden. There is no garden over there. Why do you call it rawda? Some people make this objection. On my website, someone did this objection. And I had to answer that. I said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa has said, ma bayna bayti wa minbari rawdatun min riyadh al-jannah. The area between my house and my minbar is a garden from the gardens of Jannah. So if that area can be a garden of Jannah, then why does Rasulullah's qabr cannot be a Jannah? That is also rawda of Jannah. If that area between his qabr and the minbar is rawda, garden of Jannah, then his qabr is also a place of garden of Jannah. It's also rawda. And not only Rasulullah's qabr, Rasulullah said this with regards to all believers, pious people. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-Qabr imma rawdatun min riyadh al-jannah aw hufratun min hufar al-nar. A person's grave is either a garden from the gardens of Jannah or, is, or it is a pit from the pits of Jahannam. So Rasulullah's place is a place of rawdah, bath and garden of Jannah. So we learn from over here this tabarruk, istibra. We should take barakah. Rasulullah has take told over here in this Sahih Hadith to pray two rakats over here. Uh, first at Yathrib and then at shajar e Musa and then at the city of Madian and then at the place, birthplace of Sayyiduna Isa ala Nabiina wa alayhi salam and then they move forward. The Hadith goes on that on the way Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam was going and an old lady called him out. Jibreel said, don't pay attention, keep moving. Then an old man called him out. Jibreel salam said, don't pay attention, keep moving. Then later Jibreel salam said, that old lady was dunya, world. And the world was appealing to you so that you can fall for the world, pay some attention to the world. And the world, the dunya is old because that is the amount of time that is left for this dunya. The dunya is not going to remain as much as it has remained before, thousands of years from in the past, up to Adam salam, maybe six, seven thousand years, and before that many, many thousand years. So that amount of time is not left for the dunya, very less time is left for the dunya. And that old man who was calling you was shaitan, Iblis. He was trying to att attract you, lure you, but you paid no attention to him. And inshallah, this is what will happen throughout your life. Then they move on. And they uh, approach Baytul Maqdis. And he sees Musa alayhi salatu was salam praying salah in his qabr. While he's going towards Baytul Maqdis, he passes by the grave of Musa alayhi salam and Rasulullah says, Ra'aytuhu wa huwa qa'imun yusalli fi qabri. I saw him, he was praying salah standing in his qabr. And then he moves on to Baytul Maqdis and the buraq is tied over here to a place on the rock. And Jibreel salam comes and he, he pokes the stone, rock, and there is a hole in there and he ties the burak over there. Why did he tie it? To teach you and me to be careful in our lives, take precautions. Even though burak was not going to run away, but we have been told to lock our cars, put alarms on, lock our doors when we go to sleep. And don't say that, oh, I'm doing tawakkul upon Allah. No, 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 tawakkul with asbab. So to teach us this asbab and means he uh, <coughs> uh, 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 tied the buraq over there and then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went inside the masjid. And the hadith says that the anbiya alayhi wa salatu wa salam were present and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam led them in salah. Bayhaqi narayis from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiyallahu anhu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said فَدَخَلْتُ أَنَا وَجِبْرَئِيلُ بَيْتَ الْمَقْدِسِ فعرفت النبيين من بين قائم وراكع وساجد فصلى كل واحد منا ركعتين ثم أقيمت الصلاة فأممتهم 
ان نظر حديث ابن ابي حاتم فلم البط الا يسير حتى اجتمع ناس كثير ثم اذن مؤذن فوقيمه الصلاه فقمنا صفوفا ننتظر من يؤمنا فاخذ بيدي جبرائيل فقدمني فصليت بهم the anbiya alayhim assalam were all gathered over there so it was time for salah and people were looking for someone to lead the salah jibril got hold of my hand and took me forward and he said lead the salah it's your duty to lead so behind him is ibrahim alayhis salam musa alayhis salam isa alayhis salam adam alayhis salam all the prophets from adam till isa alayhis salam were present over there this is ruhani presence ruhani spiritual presence allah subhanahu wa ta'ala somehow brought them from their qabr and wherever they are buried to baitul maqdis and rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was told to lead them in order to show that he is sayyidul awwalin wal akhirin he is the leader of mankind and he is the leader he is imamul anbiya he is the leader of all prophets So Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam led them in salah and then Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam came out fa hanat as as he came out Jibril alayhi salatu wasallam brought two vessels bowls <coughs> one with milk and the other with wine and he said take your pick so Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam took the milk and he said bismillah and he drank it جبريل عليه السلام قال اخترت الفطره اما انك لو اخذت الخمر لغوت امتك you have chosen the fitrah the natural deen if you had taken the wine then it would have had effect on your community your ummah they would have also uh, gone astray because wine leads a person astray first question is Why did he offer both of them? The answer is well at that time wine was not yet be haram. The hurmat of wine came many years later in Medina Munawwara in the year 4 after Hijra after Ghazwa Uhud. So at that time of Mi'raj there was no instruction with regards to the prohibition of a uh, hurmat of wine. So it was like milk, it was like water, it was like juice. So it was offered the sulla could have drunk it. Then why did Rasulullah not choose it? Because Allama Shabir Ahmad Usmani writes in Futuh al-Mulim because he had never drunk wine in his life. Even before prophethood, even before being told that it's haram, he had never touched it. So that is why his knee naturally he naturally inclined towards the milk and he took the milk and because milk is natural, it is the first ghiza of a baby. the first nourishment food of a baby so it's natural before you start roti boti you st- you uh, uh, start with milk so milk is a natural ghiza and food nourishment for a human being right from the beginning that's why the indication was that you have taken the natural deen and you will remain on the fitrat and nature and your ummah will also remain on hidayat inshallah it will not be led astray like the other ummahs like the other ummahs before us you know the whole ummah and the whole nation was misled by shaitan and by only a few handful remain on the track like buhaira rahib and nastura rahib and others otherwise the whole nation went astray so rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was told because you took the fitri uh, uh, ghiza and your food your ummah will stay on track inshallah and they won't be uh, led astray collectively and this is why the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said la tajtami'u ummati ala dalalatin inna allah la yajma'u ummati ala dalalatin both hadith in sahih uh, in mishkat al masabih and from there we take the indication that ijma' of ummah is hujjah when the ummah collectively says consensus on one uh, 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 one uh, one masala then that that masala and that ummah consensus is a dalil and evidence and proof that this is haq in the eyes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the dalil is not only in hadith or even not only in quran but also in ijma and also in qiyas as maulana zakaria sahib will explain to you so ijma ummah is also a hujjah and dalil which we derive from here Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam drinks that and then things move forward. Now 
Jibreel A.S. takes him forward and Mi'raj is brought. Now from here, did they leave the Burak over there or did they write on the Burak? There are two versions. You know, let me explain over here how much effort our ulama have made in preserving the deen. Mawlana Idris Kandalvi, a very nice personality, he has written Siratul Mustafa. And it is said that once Hadar Mawlana was studying, researching, you know, he was a very skinny person, not with a very heavy build, and he was researching, his sleeves rolled up, and books around him, and he, you know, looking over here, looking in this book, looking in this kitab, looking in this kitab. Someone said, Hazrat, what are you doing? What are you doing? He said, I'm doing research of Hadith's Miraj's Hadith. So that burak, which is what the Jibiri Alayhi Salaam has been found there, then what burak has happened? He didn't find anywhere. He's looking for it. I'm looking for what happened to the burak after this. And for that, he said, yeah, I want the real, you know, with the hawala, that what happened, with the reference. And for that reference, I'm searching through all these kitabs. So this is how much research they went into before noting anything down. And majority of what I'm narrating over here to you is from Siratul Mustafa. So there are two versions over here. One is that Burak remained over there and Mi'raj, meaning the step ladder or the lift or the escalator type something was brought and Rasulullah stood on there. And the other is, Rasulullah rode on the Burak and he went on the Burak. Or Muhaddisin gave combination between both by saying Rasulullah sat on the Burak and the Burak stood on the lift. And, and then they both went on that lift up to the high above the heavens. And within a blink of an eye, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was high above, up to the heavens. On the first heavens, the door is knocked. This shows that there is protection over there. Nobody can penetrate and go over there. There are special, you know, like police chalkies, angels guarding the doors and the gateways to go up. It's not an open green light. Anybody can go from anywhere. There are protections and borders, like we have borders over here in the, you know, in this dunya for come between countries. So there are borders between the heavens. So when they went to that border, there was a huge gate, and Jibreel Islam knocks on that gate. And the Malaika on the other side ask a question, who is this? And he says, it's Jibreel. And who is that with you? It's Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Has he been invited, called over? And Jibreel replies, yes, he has been called over. So they open the gate and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam enters. And he sees Sayyiduna Adam ala nabiyyina wa alayhi salatu wa sallam. And Adam alayhi salam greets him, says, Marhaban bil ibn salih wal nabiyy salih wa la ni'ma al majeehu jara. Welcome, dear son and dear prophet. You have come on a very nice occasion, very nice moqa. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa replies, happy, maybe a little bit of conversation, but here he narrates this much. In another hadith, Rasulullah says, I saw Adam salam on his right, there were some souls, and on his left, there were some souls. Souls of human beings, ruh, arwah, spirit. When he would look towards his right, he would feel happy. Towards his left, he would feel sad. He asked Jibreel, what is this? And Jibreel said, the souls on the right are the ones who are going to go in Jannah, and the left are going in Jahannam. They are all his children. So when he looks at his children who are going to Jannah, he feels good. When he looks at those who are going to Jahannam, he feels sad because he is the father after all. And these are the souls, Ibn Hajar says, that who have not yet come into this dunya, but before uh, Adam is there, and from there they are brought down, and then they are taken uh, to, to the soul bodies, and then whatever they do, and they go to their places later on after they spend their lives. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa moves on. On the second heaven, same procedure, knock knock, who's there, Muhammad, Jibreel, who's with you, Muhammad, has he been invited, yes, and the door is opened up, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sees there, Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam, and Sayyiduna Yahya alayhi salam, Ibn al-Khala, and they both say, Marhaban bin Nabi Salih, wal akhi Salih, welcome good brother, and welcome good prophet, and uh, they have maybe this conversation, they move on, 
On the third heaven, same procedure, knock knock, who's there? Jibra'il, who's with you? Muhammad, has he been invited? Yes. Okay, gate is opened up and they go to the third heaven and they see Sayyiduna Yusuf ala Nabiina wa alayhi salatu wassalam. And Yusuf alayhi salam also greets by marhaban bil akhi salih wa nabi salih. Now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, when I saw Yusuf alayhi salam, I was just amazed. His beauty was amazing. Maybe he was given half the beauty of the creation. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, after watching and talking with Yusuf alayhi salam, moved on. Fourth heaven, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam sees Idris alayhi salam. وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِدْرِيسِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ صِدِّيقًا نَبِيًّا وَرَفَعْنَاهُ مَكَانًا عَلِيًّا on the fifth heaven, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sees Sayyiduna Harun alayhi salam. And on the sixth, Musa alayhi salam. And on the seventh, Ibrahim alayhi salam. So Adam, Isa and Yahya, Yusuf, Idris, Harun, Musa and Ibrahim alayhi salam. He sees these prophets on, on the heavens while he is going through. And not only the prophets, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa also sees the angels who are in ibadat and worship of Allah. On one occasion he says, أَطَّتِ السَّمَاءَ وَحُقَّ لَهَا أَن تَئِطَّ وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ مَا فِيهَا مَوْضِعُ أَرْبَعِ أَصَابِعِ إِلَّا وَمَلَكٌ وَاضِعٌ جَبْهَتَهُ سَاجِدًا لِلَّهِ والله لو تعلمون ما أعلم لضحكتم قليلا ولا بكيتم كثيرا وما تلذذتم بالنساء على الفروشات ولا خرجتم إلى الصعودات تجهرون إلى الله. The meaning is that the heavens and the sky is squeaking because it is laden and filled with angels and malaika. There is not a space equivalent to four fingers which is, which is empty from a, a, an angel prostrating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Four angels are not empty where there is no place 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 where there is no وَمَا مِنَّا إِلَّا لَهُ مَقَامٌ مَعْلُومٌ وَإِنَّا لَنَحْنُ الصَّافُونَ وَإِنَّا لَنَحْنُ الْمُسَبِّحُونَ These are the angels and the malaika glorifying, praising, tasbih of Allah sometimes in sajda, sometimes in qiyam, sometimes in ruku and prostrating and bowing down before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he saw all these scenes and he was shown all that. He goes up to the seventh heaven and up there he sees Sidratul Muntaha. Okay, on seventh heaven, he also sees Al Baytul Ma'mur, Wat Tur, Wa Kitabim Mastur, Wa Sakfil Marfur, Wal Bahril Masjur, and Wal Baytil Ma'mur. Wal Baytil Ma'mur is a house of Allah directly above Ka'batullah Sharif. And it is similar to Ka'batullah Sharif. And just as we do tawaf of Kaaba Sharif, the Malaika do tawaf of Baytul Ma'mur. And Jibreel alayhi salam said, every day 70,000 angels perform the tawaf of Kaaba Sharif, uh, of Baytul Ma'mur. They keep doing it. And they only get the chance to do that tawaf once. After they have done their tawaf, they go on their duty. So every day a new angel is being created by Allah and that new angel, 70,000 new angels every day doing tawaf of al-baytul ma'mur and then going on their duty which is assigned to them. So he sees that tawaf of al-baytul ma'mur and he also sees Sidratul Muntaha. Sidratul Muntaha is the lot tree. It's a massive tree and you know the branches are as far as the eyes can see. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, the nabiq fruit of that, the cherries, like you know in, in dunya we have cherries. So the cherries of that fruit, they were not like our small, small cherries and strawberries and blackberries. They were huge, they were massive. 
like the goblets which are made by the people of Hajar which were massive and well known among the Arabian society that you only get those massive goblets and vessels and vases in Hajar, nowhere else. They used to make them from clay and they used to deliver them to homes. So he said the fruit was like those massive vessels or matke gita, bade bade matko gita. And the, the leaves of the tree were not small like dunya leaves, they were massive like the ears of an elephant, the size of an, ears, an elephant's ears. So this is how the tree was, and Rasulullah just looked at the tree and the fruits, and he admired them. And then suddenly, some <coughs> angels came flying, and they were in golden color, and they, they, they sat on the leaves of the tree, and the beautiful colors of that Sidratul Muntaha changed. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says in the hadith of Muslim, فَمَا يَسْتَطِيعُ أَحَدٌ أَنْ يَنْعَتَهَا مِنْ حُسْنِهَا أَحَدٌ مِنْ خَلْقِ اللَّهِ أَنْ يَنْعَتَهَا مِنْ حُسْنِهَا Nobody has the power or the words to describe the beauty of Sidratul Muntaha at that time when the Malaika were covering the leaves with the beautiful fruit and the beautiful leaves and the beautiful color of the Malaika. And I was just admired and amazed at the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in how he had created that beautiful tree and to, as far as the eyes can see and the way the Malaika covered it. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was given a tour of Jannah and he was shown Jannah. He says that I saw some rivers in Jannah and upon the river banks I saw some beautiful houses and every house was made from one single diamond like you have beach huts. So this was this Nahr and this river was Nahr of Al Kawthar. And the houses were made on the river bank of uh, Jose Kosar. When people will go there, that is where they will stay for a bit and their hospitality, mehmani will be done and they will drink from the river of Kosar. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, I saw four rivers flowing from uh, the, the roots and the, uh, the trunk of Sidratul Muntaha, that tree. I asked Jibreel, what are these? And he said, these two are rivers which are hidden, concealed, and they go towards Jannah, the river of Salsabil, and the other river of maybe Kawthar or whatever. And then two rivers are open which you can see, and they are the rivers of Al Nil and Al Furat, Nile and Euphrates. These rivers are in this dunya. River Nile is the longest river in the world. And where does the water start from? Allah knows best. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala produces it. Normally when you have huge oceans, then their water is salty. But river Nile is huge and its water is sweet. And it goes through the whole country of Sudan and Egypt and people use that water to, uh, 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 to uh, use it for drinking and for uh, farming as well, for watering the trees and plants and uh, uh, their khetibari as well. So it's sweet water, that water is produced by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw these scenes. And also along with Jannah, he saw some beautiful scenes of Jannah, some mansions of Jannah, some fruits of Jannah. Also, he saw some alarming scenes of Jahannam as well. He was shown Jahannam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says that I was, I was shown Malik, I met Malik, who is the Daroha and the superintendent of Jahannam. I also met Ridwan, who is the superintendent of Jannah. When I met Ridwan and I said salam to him, Ridwan smiled at me and he replied. But when I met Malik, I did, he did salam, I did salam, he gave reply, but he never smiled. I asked Jibreel later on that, you know, whoever I met at the night of Mi'raj, they smiled at me except Malik. Why is that? And he said, you know, Malik is the superintendent of Jahannam, Dozakh. Is liye Dozakh yogi khair nahi hai. He never smiles at anyone. If he would have smiled at anyone, he would have smiled at you. But Muhammad, he never smiled at you because he is the mazhar of the ghazab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah's ghazab and anger, so he, is, he stays in that state all the time. He never smiles at anyone. So then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was seen, some, shown some scenes of Jahannam as well. 
Tabrani and Bazaar narrate from Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam saw among some scenes some people plowing the field and uh, cutting it and then every time they plow and cut this scene was shown to him so, sorry, I, I, I'm going to move on to another one. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, I saw some people who were lying, lying down and their head was being crushed with a stone, a boulder, rock. And every time it was thrown at them and the head was crushed, they would, the, 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 the rock would go, go down, the, the malaika would bring it and hit it again. So he asked, what is this? And Jibreel alayhi salam replied, these are people who would not get up for Fajr Salah, who would stay sleeping on their pillows, even though they knew they have to pray their Fajr Salah, which is Farz. They would never pray Fajr Salah. They would stay asleep, sleep, 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 sleep. And because they used to stay asleep, that is why their head is being crushed, because they used to uh, uh, abandon this important faridah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, I saw some people in front of whom there was real nice fresh meat, kebab burger, and they were leaving that fresh meat, and they were going to some rotten meat which is stinky and stenchy, and it is rotten and dirty and khabis, and they were eating from that meat. So I said, what is this? And Jibreel Islam replied that these are people who have beautiful wives, halal, in nikah, but they leave them and go to prostitutes and commit zina. So these, this is some azab shown over there that they are eating that rotten, dirty, stenchy, stinky meat. He says he saw a person who had, uh, you know, some, uh, who had gathered some log and wood and he was trying to carry that but it was really heavy upon him but he was still adding more to it. So I said, what is this? This man can't carry this load and he's increasing the load on there. And Jibreel Islam replied that this is the person who has amanat of someone and he has eaten it up, khianat, and deceived that person, is treacherous, and he's taking more amanat from people to eat them as well. So this is being shown that he will be told to gather all that amana and with that uh, mistrust and treacherous nature he will be punished in Jahannam. He saw some people whose lips were being cut with scissors. So he asked, O oh, Jibreel, who are these people? And he replied, Haulai Khutabaul Fitna. These are the people who used to give speeches in fitna and, you know, for, uh, throw fire, a fuel at the fire of fitna. And would give speeches and encourage people to fight and kill one another. So these people's mouth and their lips are being cut over there. He saw some other scenes as well. Bayaqi narrates uh, in, in his Dara'il al from Anas radiallahu anhu that he saw some people whose bellies were massive like a huge room and in that belly, in their bellies and stomachs there were snakes and scorpions biting them inside. So he said, Jibril, who are these people? And he said, these people are those who used to consume interest, riba, and sood in the dunya. So because they used to take sood from people and eat with that money and they would become fat people, fat cats, that's why their bellies and their stomachs are fat and there's snakes and scorpions in there which is uh, taking, taking them. So these are some of the things. He saw some people, you know, uh, their, 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 their lips were huge and they were putting some stones in their mouth and a stone would go inside and come out from their backside. And they kept doing that and eating those stones and rocks and they kept coming out from their backside. So, uh, he asked Jibreel, what is this? And he said, these are people who used to take the property of yatims and orphans. They used to eat up the property of yatim and never give the money to the yatim. So he was shown some of these scenes of Jahannam along with many of these pleasant scenes of Jannah as well. My dear brothers, I am only narrated these scenes of Jahannam in order to warn, as a warning for us, what Rasulullah is saying over here, don't do zina and don't eat, uh, don't consume interest 
no matter in whatever way, otherwise we will have to punish this. Zina, Sood, a, a treacherous nature, Yatim's Mal, you know, taking up miras of people and not giving any miras, not distributing it, it properly. These are all causes of azab. And Rasulullah saw these azab at that time. What Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was seen these, uh, shown these scenes, and as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says over there, Subhanallah yasra bi abdihi laylam min al masjid al haram ila al masjid al aqsa ladi baratna hawlahu li nuriyahu min ayatina. These are some of the powers and qudrats of Allah which Allah wanted to show, so He showed them. After witnessing all these scenes and coming back Sidratul Muntaha when He is there, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is then taken to the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hazrat Mawlana Idris Kandalbi rahmatullahi narrates that a jula was brought. Jula means some, a couch like a swing, a broad, a bed or couch or something was brought and it was covered with green silk cloth and Rasulullah was told to sit on there. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sat on there and then he was being taken forward. Jibreel alayhi salam said, Khuda Hafiz. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi said, Jibreel I need you more now, why are you deserting me? He said, this is my level of Sidratul Muntaha, I can't move any further. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Sidratul Muntaha means the borderline, the limit. Anything that comes up from Arsh, is taken taken down from here and anything that goes from down is taken from there and the malaika of the top and the bottom do not mix with one another Allah has kept that as a borderline so from that borderline Jibreel salam said I can't go any further this is my limit and now you have to go because you have been invited you are going by special invitation so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam moved forward and he says, Hatta zahartu li mustaban asma'u fihi sarif al aqlam. I ascended to an area where I could hear the inscribing of the pens. When there is complete silence and somebody is writing something, then you can hear the noise of scribble. So this was from Lawhi Mahfuz, the sacred tablet. The malaika who note things down from the sacred tablet, they were noting things down and they were, uh, the Rasulullah heard that scribbling of the pens as that, and he was told that these are the malaika and noting things down according to the instructions of Allah from Lawhi Mahfuz and all those instructions are then passed on to the malaika below and then according to that uh, events take place throughout the world. So he saw that and then he was taken to the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Did he see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not? There are two versions among the Sahaba. Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'in. Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhu. Sayyiduna Ka'b al-Ahbar who is among the great tabi'een. And in one narration, Sayyiduna Abu Dhar Ghifari radiyallahu anhu were of the opinion that yes, he did see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In what manner? Allah knows best. Allah knows best. Sayyiduna Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahmatullahi alayhi was asked, did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And he would say, of course, ra'ahu, 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 until he was lose breath. Of course he saw him, 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 he saw him. So these ulama wa shaykh were of the opinion that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did observe the countenance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kabi Ahbar used to say, أَتَعْجَبُونَ أَن تَكُونَ الْخُلَّةُ لِإِبْرَاهِيمُ وَالْكَلَامُ لِمُوسَى وَالرُّؤْيَةُ لِمُحَمَّدِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. Why do you feel amazed that Khullat and Khalilullah's title is given to Ibrahim alayhi salam and Kalam is given to Musa alayhi salam and Ruyat is given to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. Is me kya taajjub hai ki Ibrahim ko Khullat mile, Musa ko Kalam mile aur Muhammad ko Ruyat mile. Didar ho sake. This is the Mashayikh's uh, opinion about Sahaba. 
سیدتنا عائشہ رضی اللہ عنہ سیدنا ابو حریرہ سیدنا عبداللہ ابن مسعود رضی اللہ عنہم used to say no he did not see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he talked from behind some veil and curtain and that curtain was curtain of noor because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has curtained himself behind hijab of noor as in the hadith hijabuhu noor لو كشفه لأحرقت سبحات وجهه من تها إليه بصره من خلقه Once Jibreel a.s. was asked by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Ya Jibreel, have you seen your Rabb? And Jibreel started shaking And then he said Inna bayni wa baynahu sab'oona hijaban min noorin Law danawdu min ba'dhiha lahtarakhtu between me and him, there are 70 veils of noor, of various noors and lights. If I were to approach any of the noor, then I would burn my, I would be burnt alive. So I couldn't go. Abu Zal Ghifari radiallahu anhu says, I asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Hal ra'ayta rabbak? And he replied, ra'aytu nooran. I saw noor, he noor. He said, noorun anna arahu. He was behind noor, how can I see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So this is the second opinion. Hafiz ibn Hajar rahmatullah writes that Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhuma in another narration says ra'ahu bi fu'adihi marratayn He saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his heart two times, twice. Meaning one is vision with the physical eyes another is vision with the heart. With the heart, you know, which is called kashf. Someone is over here and he, Allah shows him something in his heart, something else which is happening somewhere. And these, these are scenes which do happen. Like we see, you know, many times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes the veils and you can see something at a, a far distance. Like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that your friend Ashama Najashi has died in uh, Ethiopia, Habasha. And uh, let's pray his janazah. He is in Medina Munawwara. The curtains are moved. He can see. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prays his janazah. Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu anhu is giving khutbah in Medina Munawwara. And he says, Ya Sari Ya Al-Jabal, Ya Sari Ya Al-Jabal. Something at a distance, but Allah shows it to him. So Allah can show someone in whichever manner he wants to. So similarly, Allah showed himself to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not with these physical eyes, with the eyes of the heart. This was a special vision and kash which was given to Allah so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the third opinion. Imam Abu Abbas al-Qurtubi rahmatullahi says, Riwayat narrations are of both types. So I would prefer tawakkuf. Meaning, don't deny and don't confront. Allah knows best. And I would say that in this day and age, this would be the better route. That just keep quiet, Allah knows best. We just move on. I narrated these various uh, opinions to you so that you can get a brief account of how the ulama debate among themselves and bring the dalails of both types. Allah knows best. al Qurtubi's right is better of taqquf. Allah knows best. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had conversation. That's the definite. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was given few things over there. Three things are mentioned in the Sahih of Muslim. One, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was given the last two ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah from Aman al-Rasul bima unzila ilayhi min rabbihi wal mu'minun kullun amana billahi wa malaikati wa kutubihi wa rasulihi la nufarriqu bayna ahadim min rasulihi wa qalu sami'na wa ata'na wa ufranaka rabbana wa ilayka al-masir la yukallifu allahu nafsan illa usaha ila akhir al-surah these two ayat were revealed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while he was there. Number two, he was given a promise that from your ummah, many of those people who had committed major sins but had not done any shirk will be forgiven. If you go with tawheed, no shirk, and although you might have major sins, but Rasulullah was promised that, oh my beloved, my Habib, because of your barakah, your presence over here, I'm giving you this in'am, which is special for you. Which was not for the previous ummats. For them, Allah will hold them to account for sahayr as well. 
And Kabair, Allah said, no, no forgiveness for Kabair unless you do Tawbah. But for your Ummah, I will forgive Kabira Gunas as well. This was the second inam and gift, a present given to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And number three, he was given the gift of 50 Salah throughout the day. That tell your Ummah to pray 50 Salah. Now remember, Salah was prescribed before Mi'raj. Because Mi'raj happened in the year 10 after Nabuwa. And as Rasulullah used to pray Salah before that. Because as soon as Nabuwa came, Iqra bismi rabbi galladhi khala, then Yahya al-Muzammil came, and Jibreel salam came, and he, you know, he taught him how to do wudu and how to pray Salah. And from then on, from earlier on, the, the Muslims started praying Salah. So they had been praying Salah for the last 10 years. But these five times daily salah which we pray now with the timings and the details, they were not prescribed. And these details are now being given over here. So Rasulullah is told, Muhammad, you know the salah you pray, tell your ummah to pray 50 times a day. So Rasulullah says, okay. And he comes down. And while he is descending, he now passes by Sidratul Muntaha by Sayyiduna Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam sends a message. And he says, you know, Muhammad, can you take one message to your ummah? Tell them, inna al-jannata qiyan, wa inna ghirasaha subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wa allahu akbar. <coughs> Jannat is like an open plain field. And the trees to plant in there are through, subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wa allahu akbar. Every time you say Subhanallah, a tree will be planted for you in Jannah. So said, tell your Ummah to read these tasbihat as much as you can and plant your uh, trees in the Jannah because that is the only time to plant. Because once you die and you go in your cover and you want to say Subhanallah, the angel will say, sorry, your books are closed. You want to read Allah, sorry, your book is closed. You want to pray Tula Kat Namaz, sorry, your book is closed. So whatever you want to add in your book of deeds, you have to do it while you are alive. After that, you can't do it. So he said, make sure you fill your Jannah with as many trees as you can. Otherwise, you come here, your, your Jannah will be empty. There will be no trees. So if you want trees to be planted in your Jannah, then read these tasbihat as much as you can. Rasulullah thanks Ibrahim salam, and he comes down. When he comes down on the sixth heaven and he meets Musa alayhi salam, <coughs> Musa alayhi salam asked, Muhammad, what have you been given? And he said, I have been given 50 salah. 50 salah? You almost can't pray 50 salah. <laughs> go back, go back, go back. Tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reduce the salah. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa goes back. And he says, you know, oh Allah, can you please reduce the amount of salah? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reduces them. There are three riwayat over here in Muslim. One is, فَوَضَعَانِي shatraha." Other is Ashr, another is Khams. Five. The, the most authentic one is the five one. That Allah reduced five salah. So how many left now? 45. So he comes back, Musa alayhi salam says, how many? 45. No, 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 go back. So Rasulullah goes back, 40. Comes back, go back, 35. 35, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10. And now he goes back. And Allah says, okay, tell your ummah to pray five. And they will pray five, but I will give them the sawab of 50. <laughs> because I take one hasana and multiply it by 10 times. So you will pray one namaz and I will take it as you have prayed 10 namaz. You pray five times a day, I will take it as you have prayed 50 namaz. أَمْضَيْتُ فَرِيضَتِي وَخَفَّفْتُ عَنْ عِبَادِي مَنْ جَاءَ بِالْحَسَنَةِ فَلَهُ عَشْرُ مثالها. So he brings this down. And now Musa salam says, how many? Five. He said, no, go back. Tell Allah to reduce that as well. Because I have tried to make Bani Israel pray twice and they couldn't pray two. How is your mother going to pray five? So Rasulullah salam said, no, I have been so many times. I feel ashamed now. I will try my best and get my mother to pray five times a day somehow. So he now comes back. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower his rahman, durood and salam upon Musa alayhi salam's cover. <laughs> because his ihsan and favor upon us that he reduced it to five. Otherwise people don't pray five, how would I pray fifty? 
So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes down and then as we mentioned Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam descends to where he was in Baytul Maqdis and he looks at Baytul Maqdis again and then on Burak he comes back when he is coming back he sees many caravans traveling towards Makkah Mukarramah as well so he looks at them with his naked eyes and they are they are camped at so and so place sleeping and you can see them sleeping as well where their camels are how far they are and then he arrives at Makkah Mukarrama and the hadith is for Subhaha Kaba eating Rasulullah spent came in the morning in Makkah Mukarrama as though he had spent the night there everybody was still sleeping so he approaches and he goes to Mihani's house and Mihani was also looking where did he go so he he says that this is what happened. And uh, Umm Hani says, please don't tell people. And uh, Rasulullah says, no, I will definitely tell them. How much time is the prayer? 7 minutes. 7 minutes. But now there is a lot of time. Let's go, no one. Let's go, let's go, let's go, inshallah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes out. And you know in the morning, and you know the first person he meets. Who does he meet first? Abu Jahl. <laughs> and Abu Jahl says, Muhammad Sahib, kaise ho ko nahi purani? Anything new? And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, yes, there is some news. What is the breaking news? The breaking news is, I've just been to Baitul Maqdis, Jerusalem, and come back. What? You've been to Jerusalem, Maqdis? Baitul Maqdis, Jerusalem? Yes. It takes us one month on camel rides and through many strides and mountainous terrain to get to Baitul Maqdis and one month to come back. So that two months journey, you did that in one night? Said, yes, yes, I did that in one night. I went myself on Burah and I have come back. Okay, if I call the people, will you say this to them as well? Of course I will say this to them. And he goes around, hey, people come here, come here, come here, nice news, news to hear, good news here. And they all gather. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is told to stand in between among all the mushriks, maybe there might be some Muslims as well. And then Abu Jahl says, can you say it to them? And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa tells them that I've been to Jerusalem, Baitul Maqdis and come back. And they start laughing. <laughs> Muhammad, you've told us of so many things. We believed in them. Now you are saying something really absurd. How can you do this? How can you claim these types of things? And say, I'm telling you the truth. I'm not lying. I'm telling you the truth. I've been there. And they say, it can't be possible. But I'm telling you, it's, it's happened. It's a miracle. It's a mu'jiza. So they talk among themselves and they say, okay, let's check him out. So they are, say, you know, some of them had been to Jerusalem and they had seen Baitul Maqdis. So they started asking questions. Now they say, okay, tell us, you know, how is the building? How are the walls? What color is that? How is the mihrab? How is the mimbar? How is the carpet? Like, for example, in our day and age. And Rasulullah sallallahu says that in Sahih Muslim's hadith, that I was standing in Hatim. And they were showering questions upon me and so many questions that, you know, I was just boggled. I didn't know what to say because they asked me about things which I had not even seen properly because it was only a single glance. Now I have come over here to your masjid, I have only seen it. Now when I go and somebody asks me, how was the Islamic center in Aylesbury, what am I going to say? Maybe a few things I might remember, but not everything. So Rasulullah said, فَكُرِبْتُ كُرْبَةً مَا كُرِبْتُ مِثْلَهَا قَدْتُ you know, I was overcome by worry and shaken in such a manner that this, this type of anxiety had never come upon me. And you know what happens? Allah opened up Baytul Maqdis before me. It was right before my eyes. Any question they ask, I see it and I give them the answer. It's right before my eyes. All questions I answer, if, and every question, they showered questions and questions and questions. In the end, they said, well, every answer was right. Everything he said, correct. And now, the many mushrikeen, they started running around. And someone rushed to uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq's house and uh, said that, look, he's claiming these types of things. And Abu Bakr said, if he, has he said that? Yes. What did he say? He said, well, he went from Baytul uh, Makkah to Baytul Maqdis. Now remember, Rasulullah did not even tell them about the journey of the heavens, Mi'raj. 
He only told them about Isra from Makkah to Baitul Maqdis. He didn't see anything else. So Abu Bakr Siddiq said, he said that he went from Makkah to Baitul Maqdis and came back in one night. <coughs> yeah, well, if he's saying it, then he's done it. He's true. I believe in him. So how can that be possible? Well, I believe in, I believe in him when he says something more amazing. He tells me that the Malaika, they go high above the heavens and come back every day. They have two shifts, morning and evening. And the shift changes in Fajr and Asr. So if I believe in him that the Malaika can, can go up and down in the blink of an eye, then why can he not go from Makkah to Baitul Maqdis here in the blink of an eye in a small portion of the night? Go away from here. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, this is when Abu Bakr Siddiq was given the title of Siddiq. So this is how the events unfolded on that night of Mi'raj. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's morale was boosted. His iman was strengthened through that iman and hikmah which was placed in his heart. And this is the miraculous journey. It's not a myth. It's not a fairy tale. It's true. It's in the Quran. And it's not a dream like some people try to make it. Nor is it a vision. It's, it's a physical uh, journey with this body, earthly body of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is why when Allah starts the narration of uh, Isra Mi'raj, how does he start off? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Subhanalladhi Asra bi abdihi laylam min al masjid al haram min al masjid al aqsa. Subhanalladhi. Subhan. Subhan means Allah ki zaad paak hai. Glory be to Allah. Hallowed be to Allah. Don't underestimate the power of Allah. Don't question the qudrat of Allah. Allah has the power to do this. That is why he is saying Subhan al -Lazi. Now look, if it was a dream, then why does Allah need to say Subhan al -Lazi? Because dream is not amazing. In dreams, people can go from one place to the other, from here to Pakistan and come back. So in dreams, anything can happen. So you don't need to say Subhan. Subhan is indicating towards the physical, uh, physical nature of the journey. Secondly, Asra bi Abdihi. You know Asra bi Abdihi, the term Asra bi Abdihi is used for physical movement, not for dreams. Like Allah said in another place, For Asri bi Ibadi Laylan innakum muttaba'oon. He said to Musa alayhi salam, O Musa, take my servants by night from the area of Fir'aun and uh, away from here, save them from here. So the Asri bi Ibadi was no dream. It was in reality the whole qawm was taken by night and they left the area of Bani Israel, Bani Israel left from the Kifti area at night. So Asri bi Ibadi is loved or used for, uh, for moving, traveling by night. So he traveled by night with his physical body from Baytullah Baitul Sharif to Baytul Maqdis. And why did he take him there? لِنُرِيَهُ min ayatina. Many signs were shown in the form of meeting with Anbiya Ali Musalam and other signs which you have just witnessed. So for that reason, we took him from there to there. Sarayta min haramin laylan ila harami, kama sara al-badru fi dajin min al-dhulami, wa bitta tarqa ila an nilta manzilatan, min qaba qawseyni lam tudrak wa lam turami, like the sahibi Qasida Buddha has said, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us belief in all the miracles of our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and keep our iman intact, and uh, keep us steadfast on Sirat al-Mustaqeem. Give us tawfiq to pray five times a day, all namaz, will you pray in charge? Allah. Give us tawfiq to avoid all the sins of zina and riba and all the sins which were mentioned. Keep us steadfast on Sirat al Mustaqim. May Allah accept our gathering sitting over here. Wa akhil da'wana alhamdulillah. Bil alameen sallallahu sallam ala sayyidina Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam.